So welcome to this presentation of the best practice systems engineering methodology. This presentation is divided into several parts so that you can follow them as you like. But I suggest that you do take them in a certain order so that the input data and output data is coming in a certain order so that it's easier to follow the, the process flow. So before we start the actual demonstrations of the various steps in the process, I just would like to give you some of the the background to the BPSE process as we call it. So one fundamental principle of System Weaver is its adaptability or flexibility where you can completely configure it in any way you like. So this is of course something that has been appreciated by our customers for over 20 years when we can deploy solutions for their specific needs and their specific methodologies. However, we have also seen that there is sometimes a request from customers that they would like to get our best practices, a starting point, you could say, where you can start working directly out of the box, more or less, uh, in a, just installing and in a few moments be up and running. And of course, this is a good thing. And we see that we have then, for this purpose, taken all our best practices patterns from over 20 years of experience and put them into one process that we know is working. It has been proven in combat to the different steps has been proven in combat uh, with our uh, customers. Now, to be honest, this best practice is maybe not the best practice. There are multiple ways, of course, of doing this, and they are all good practices. So there are alternative patterns available that you can use, and you can take out some part and add some parts, and you can also, of course, change it completely so that you get a completely different solution in the end. But this is something that you can define as you go along. So as we say, uh, you can start simple and evolve with System Weaver. You can start with the BPSC setup or an alternative BPSC setup as a starting point. And then you evolve and change parts of the patterns or all of the patterns as your challenges change over time. So what we will be looking at here in this uh, presentation is not something that is fixed. You can change it into close to anything. So uh, that is something that I want you to bear in mind when we look at the following steps of the BPSC process. Now, before we start, it may be good to repeat some of the mechanisms, the basic mechanisms of System Weaver. I hope that you have taken any sort of basic presentation before this so that you understand the basic concepts of System Weaver. But uh, I still, I think this will be a very quick overview of how System Weaver works. So as I mentioned before, it's really a, a real-time collaboration information management platform that has been used in over 20 years within both large and medium-sized organizations developing complex products. And the way it's technically set up is, as you see in this uh, picture in this slide here, at the bottom here, we have something that we call the meta model, where you set up the information artifacts, the item types, as we call them here, that you want to work with. It could be requirements, test cases, functions, software components, physical components, interfaces, and so on. These are all item types in the meta model universe of your installation. The other part, important part of the meta models is the what we call the part types or the relations that you can use to tie together or relate different information artifacts or item types to each other. When you have set up the meta model, you can then define models based on the information sets that you have defined or the rules that you have defined in your meta model. And you can only define models that are in line with the metadata in your System Weaver setup. On the next level, we have then the client side where we have the System Weaver client, the System Weaver Explorer. And this then is the way that the user community, the development organization operates on the information. So if you have one user, for instance, editing a requirement, and this requirement is also used by other users in a different model with a different person working on that set, but you actually use the same requirement. If this is edited by one of the users, it will be reflected on the server in the complete model, and it will then be pushed out to all clients that have this information in their client. So this is truly really collaborative. It is millisecond update over vast geographical distances. We have customers working both in China and Europe with uh, in normal cases high latency, but we handle this by using mirror servers and so on so that we can actually make sure that everybody has the information at their fingertips when they need it. 
So let's take a look then at the best practice systems engineering process. This has a number of major steps in it. And we will go through the majority of them in this presentation. This is the sort of the core steps in the process, the stakeholder level, the system analysis level, the function development level. You have the component design and the software design, which in the end is integrated into one product. So you have it from the starting point to the end point. So starting at the stakeholder level and then in the end getting a complete product. Of course, there are also supporting processes like test and verification, safety and risk analysis, uh, which are connected to all these levels. So test and verification, of course, you can set up test cases and, and produce test specifications for all the levels in the development process. You also have safety and risk analysis, which is, of course, something that you do also on multiple levels uh, based on various mechanisms uh, to like FMEA and FTA and stuff like this. The blue parts here denote things that are more basic management of information. So life cycle and baseline management is, of course, a very important part and that is also where you come into the, the solutions for configuration and, and being able to manage reuse of different parts in other larger contexts and this is also very strong we have very strong mechanisms in system weaver for this variants of course and product line engineering is important of course we would possibly like to have no variants just to have one that would be of course the cheapest and easiest way but this is not the way it works uh, today. Uh, all products have variability and uh, because otherwise you are not really relevant or interesting for your customers. So this is something that we need to address, uh, variants in product line engineering. And this is also something that is supported by the platform. Uh, finally, we also have, of course, review support where you can do review of your system development artifacts or your product development artifacts and also keep track on the review status and so on so that you can see that when you end up in the final product that you have done all the reviews and that all potential comments or findings have been managed in a proper way. So if we start to look at the stakeholder level, this is basically talking about very fluffy requirements from market departments, customers, customer interviews. It can be also legal departments or even legislation from the, the countries or, or various standards that you need to follow to make sure that your product is safe, for instance, or that doesn't have chemicals in it that is, is harmful and so on. So this is the level where, you, where you're, you're allowed to be a bit vague in your definitions of what you actually want and need. And it can also be inconsistent and incomplete and so on. So what this ends up in is a number of stakeholder requirements or stakeholder requests or needs or whatever we want to call it. We, we call it stakeholder requirements. So it's something that the stakeholders require from the product. Another important concept that we have in this uh, BPSC methodology is the keyword concept. We also sometimes refer to it as an anatomy because at this point you define the things that you have, will have, think that you will have in your product. And when I say things, I mean things like functionality or components. So if you're, for instance, developing a car, you might talk about steering wheel and uh, tires and seats and infotainment systems and adaptive cruise uh, functionality and so on. So these are all words that you can use to describe in general what, what you're intending that the product will include. And what we have seen at customers is that we, I mean, there are um, some literature that claims that the stakeholder level and system level and functional levels and so on should be kept away from actually talking about the solutions. Now, that is all very well, but in practice, this makes it a bit complicated because if you're actually developing a car, you pretty much know that it will have wheels uh, and steering wheel and seats and so on. Uh, of course, this can change in the future when you go to autonomous drive and so on, but you do have some concepts of what you think that your product will include when you start the work. And for this reason, we think it's important to have this possibility to talk about the things that are supposed to be in the product in an early phase. So what we also use the keywords for is then to be able to relate all the information that is developed during the complete process flow here. And by doing so, we can use the anatomy or the keywords as something that we can connect the information to. And by connecting the information, such as requirements, test cases, and so on, or the specific functions or whatever it is, we can also 
make sure that it's a way to find the information that is related to any downstream activity. So for instance, when the system analysis write product requirements on, let's say, the adaptive cruise control function, you connect that to the function ID of adaptive cruise control. And by doing so, the function development side can then say that, okay, now I'm developing the requirements for the function, the software part of the function adaptive cruise control. I then relate to this function ID in the anatomy or in the keyword list, and I can then look at all the requirements and all the incoming analysis and so on that has been done in the upstream activities. So the next step after the stakeholder needs has been derived, you come into the system analysis, and this is a pretty large task. You look at the stakeholder requirements coming in, uh, you also look at the keywords and, and what those stakeholder requirements have been connected to, and you start to look at them and you try to derive basically a systems architecture, which is the physical part of the architecture in our setup here. This is basically the system part IDs or the components, the, the, the parts, the things in your product that will become part numbers eventually. So this is the first sort of sketch of what you will, will physically contain in your product and how they connect to each other. You also derive then on those uh, system architecture artifacts, some product requirements that, that can state, they, and these should be very crispy. Uh, they should be clear and concise and defining exactly what you want from the components in your system architecture. And this is a, as opposed to the stakeholder requirements where you can be quite uh, unclear and vague and so on. Another important part is, of course, the functional architecture or the logical architecture, as it's sometimes referred to. We call it here a high-level function definition, but it's really a functional architecture talking about what functions do we see from the stakeholder level that we need to uh, get the product to actually deliver to the user or to whatever stakeholder there is around the product. So this logical architecture or function architecture is then derived, and we also, this one, put product requirements so that we will define in a clear way what requirements the functions should fulfill. Another part of the definition from the system analysis is to identify also what kind of product lines you have. If you have different levels of the product, if you have then also on those levels variability in terms of if functionality should be in or not. And so for this purpose we do have the, the product lining and the variant family definitions that we need to set up here because this is very important then for the continued development that you can relate your requirements and your designs to something in the variant families and then you can automatically filter your uh, your product so that you can say that okay now i want to test the product on the highest level well then i can filter out all the test cases related to that product so once the system analysis is done, we then move to the function development, which is, well, it, it's, it's something you do just to define your requirements on the software part more clearly and being even more crisp. And here is also a place where you can do some analysis of how the function behaves. You can do use cases and things like this, and also state machines and things that describe uh, and, and give you an, an understanding of what requirements to place on your software design. So we have to note that in this, on this level, both on the system analysis level and on the functional level, you could see it as a design, but it's not really design at this point. It's a way to move gradually towards uh, software design, but the actual software design is done in the next step based on the requirements coming from the functions level. So this is important to know that in this case, we have chosen not to make any use cases or state machines or, or anything like this as boundary diagrams as requirements, but they are more analysis models on this level where you can analyze your functionality to then derive the requirements that you put on the software design. In the next step, we then do the actual software design. And here we are allowed to define uh, software components, their interfaces, how they are connected to each other, and uh, to make sure that they fulfill the functional content of the functional intention of the product. So here you actually derive the software architecture. So this is where the actual software design is taking place. And if we then go from the, the system architecture side, where we want to then also place requirements. Primarily, this is a requirements phase. We collect the requirements, the product requirements from the system level, and we derive very crispy component specifications, you could say, on components that will be sourced by you know, some suppliers that, that delivers this, or that is developed and, and produced in-house. Uh, either way, you need to make a complete set of a, a clear requirement set for the component that you want to develop. So finally, you then come to the stage where you need to integrate the software with 
the physical side or the, the hardware and uh, because the components here can also be mechanical and so on but it also contains the the hardware and the the software part the load module part of the product and these are then integrated in the last step here to see that the software is running on some hardware to be able to create the functionality of the complete product so now we're almost ready to move into looking at the demonstrations of the different steps in the BPSC methodology. Uh, but before we do that, we just take a brief look at the example that we're using in this uh, continued uh, presentation. Uh, and we have chosen an electric toothbrush because it's a product that is usually known for most people. It's simple enough to understand, but at least seemingly simple, but it contains both mechanical parts, it has electronics and it has software, and it also has added functionality that evolves over time. So for instance, when we start developing the toothbrush, it may be just a tooth toothbrush. And then as we move along further, we get also the possibility of adding functionality. So it's not starting over. You usually have some kind of product already in production that you then need to make additions to. So it's, it's actually evolving over time. So for this purpose, we've chosen this as an example. So now we're ready to go and uh, I suggest that you start taking the, the demonstration in the order of looking at the stakeholder level, then the system analysis level, the function level, the component level and then finally the, the software design and the integration of the product. So I hope you find this useful and uh, let's move on to the next step.